Well, indeed, and, and other uh, right honourable and honourable members have made reference, Madam Deputy Speaker, to the religious minorities in Syria and the impact this conflict is having upon them. And we've had uh, some very colourful um, and dreadful descriptions of what's happening in Syria. And I think, in, in terms of, of uh, uh, the, the steps that we take next, back, it makes no sense whatsoever for the West to have made great play of getting the UN inspectors in to visit the site and inspect the site, only then to have a vote in this House without having actually had the report back from the weapons inspectors to determine the evidence as it is on the ground. So perhaps, Madam Deputy Speaker, the rationale for this debate has moved on somewhat, welcome though that is, but it gives us also an opportunity to raise some questions of the Government, because I, for one, remain unconvinced by the arguments I have heard this evening for military action. But we normally seek cui bono, who benefits from this, and no one's given a really plausible explanation why, with United Nations um, in investigators in Baghdad, that the Assad regime would want to let off there and then. It's absolutely clear that we're being driven by a time that has no basis of anything other than appeasing the fact that the, the, the President of America said last year a, a red line has been drawn, that red line is being crossed. We saw this ten years ago when we were driven by a deadline for an American President, which was a deadline for him to get re-elected in 2004. We were wrong to follow him then, we were wrong to follow him now. So many of us have a reluctance uh, over matters involving peace and war because we sat here and listened to a Prime Minister at that dispatch box tell us something which I believe now to have been a fabric of lies. And I cannot sit in this House and be duped again by any other Prime Minister, whether it is of my own party or of the party that sits opposite. Thank God, Mr. Speaker, for the erudition and historical memory of the last three speeches, almost entirely absent in the Prime Minister's initial address. He was clearly making a speech which was not the one he intended to make here this afternoon. Otherwise, he would not have persuaded you at vast public expense to recall the House of Commons to decide that we're actually going to decide on this matter next week or the week after when we're back here in any case. It's absolutely evident that if it were not for the democratic revolt which has been underway in this House of Commons and outside in the wider public against this war, that the engines in Cyprus would now be revving and the cruise missiles ready to fly this very weekend. And any attempt by the Prime Minister to pretend that he had always, all along, intended on this course of action is just bunkum. And the reason for the unease here on both sides of the House, two exceptional speeches from the last Speaker and the member from New Forest East, encompass the feelings of the people in the country. Only 11% of the public, according to the Daily Telegraph this morning, support Britain becoming involved in a war in Syria. Can ever a British government have imagined sending its men and women to war with the support of just 11% in public opinion? First, that there is no compelling evidence, to use the leader of the opposition's words, that the Assad regime is responsible for this crime yet. Not that they are not bad enough to do it, Mr. Speaker. Everybody knows they are bad enough to do it. The question is, are they mad enough to do it? To launch a chemical weapons attack in Damascus on the very day that a United Nations chemical weapons inspection team arrives in Damascus must be a new definition of madness. And of course, if he is that mad, how mad is he going to be once we've launched a blizzard of Tomahawk cruise missiles upon his country? Now, as I heard the front benches describe how bad he was, I wonder just why 
The former Prime Minister forced Her Majesty to billet him in her guest room at Buckingham Palace just a few years ago, and how a former Prime Minister recommended him for an honour, and how he was hailed in all corners as a moderniser. But of course the narrative has changed because the government is intent on regime change in Damascus. Which brings me to the only other point I'm going to be able to make in the time available. The reason for the unease is that people can see the character of the Syrian opposition. They have seen the videos. We've heard about horrific videos. Take a look at the video of one of the commanders of the Syrian revolution cutting open the chest of a human being and eating his heart and liver and videotaping himself and putting it up on YouTube because he thought it might be considered attractive. Take a look at the videos of Christian priests having their heads sawn off, not chopped off, sawn off with bread knives. Even a bishop in the Christian church was murdered by these people. Every religious minority in Syria, and there are 23 of those, is petrified at the victory of the Syrian rebels that the British Prime Minister and Foreign Secretary have been doing their utmost to supply with weapons and money these last two years, and they cannot deny it. They say it's now about this crime, whoever committed it. But it's been the government's policy for two years to bring about the defeat of the regime in Damascus and the victory of the kind of people responsible for these crimes. I have 20 seconds left. <laughs> Willingly. <laughs> if only for another 60 seconds. Remember, the Honourable Member had made reference, but let's remember where those arms have come from over decades from this country's supply to Syria. Indeed, indeed. I have now 60 seconds at my disposal, so let me make this point more clearly. When did Russia and China, two and a half billion people, cease to be members of the international community? Who are you on the other side? to decide what the international community thinks should do. If you are unable to persuade the Security Council to go along with your point of view, who are you to decide that you will launch a war in any case? The, you see, I, I, I keep hearing about the unreasonable use of the veto. I've heard that many times over the last few years in this House. The United States has vetoed every attempt to obtain justice for the Palestinian people and to punish and issue retribution for international lawbreaking on the part of Israel. And nobody in this House has said one word about it. Yes, I'll give way. I'm very grateful for the Honourable Member for giving way to me. Mr Speaker, I think you would be very interested to know that I've had several um, constituents email me about comments made by the Honourable Member for Bradford West on the Iranian Press TV, in which my constituent claims that the Honourable Member said that Israel supplied the chemical for the attacks in Syria. Yeah. I would find that very hard to believe that the Honourable Member said that. So would he like to take this opportunity to refute that yeah. or yeah. provide the evidence to satisfy my constituent? Well, it just shows the unreliability of relying upon green ink letters, whether they come in the post or in emails. For I said no such thing. But the Syrian rebels definitely had sarin gas because they were caught with it by the Turkish government, as was referred to uh, by the former uh, government minister opposite, if you'll forgive me, I forget his constituents say. The truth is this. Uh, uh, I, know, I, know mine, I know mine, it's where I gave you such a bloody good hiding just over a year ago. The Syrian rebels have got plenty of access to sarin. It's not rocket science, Mr. Speaker. A group of Shinto obscurantists in Japan living on Mount Fuji poisoned the Tokyo underground with sarin gas less than 20 years ago. You don't have to be Einstein to have your hands on sarin gas or the means to distribute it. Russia and China say no to war. 
So do I and most people in this country. Mr. Andrew. If not, what on earth are we doing arming all these nations to the teeth? It is time for the Arab League to step up to the plate and for Western countries to recognise that we cannot continue to impose solutions because those solutions fuel resentment and they harden attitudes. They raise the question about the double standards of the West across the Middle East. Where was the world's policeman in 1985 when Iran was under sustained attack from chemical weapons. It suited the West to be supporting Iraq in that situation. Why did we allow the world's policemen to weaponize white phosphorus? White phosphorus, when it contacts the skin and burns as it oxidizes, burns right down to the bone. If that's not a chemical weapon, what is? At the moment, this House has endorsed the principle of direct peace talks between the Palestinians and the Israeli government. What do we think would the reaction be if we have action against Syria and then Syrian reaction against both Britain and potentially other countries in the region? It would destabilise those talks and probably end the chances of peace in the Middle East forever. The course of Tony Blair haunts this debate, but much more so the course of Hans Blick haunts this debate. We should have listened to him in 2003. We should have given him time. We should have waited. The one independent voice in the whole arena we ignored. We shouldn't do that again. We should be very, very clear what we're doing tonight. What we're doing tonight is given nothing more than a remit to the government to go forward, improve what's happened now. We are not giving a green light for any military action whatsoever. This was a French colony. We are British and we ought to reject the concept that we've already tried the regime and that we're therefore pushing to war. And I want my constituents to know the reason why I cannot support such a motion predicated on such a thought. Yeah. At the very least, the doctrine of humanitarian intervention has a tenuous basis in current international law and this renders NATO action legally questionable. So those people who want to rest the argument for a Syrian war on the Kosovan precedent need to read their law again. And what I think President Obama has done is got the West Wing series out. Look what President Bartlett would do under the circumstances. There is exactly that episode. If we bomb Damascus airport, we're going to kill thousands of people, but they'll never do it again. And of course, the experts say if you do that, the whole world will be against you. And he said, well, what do we do? Well, you just do, you bomb a few buildings, which have been emptied because everybody knows which buildings are going to be bombed. And that has, the president says that has no effect. And the experts say to him, yes, but that is actually what you have to do. You have to have a response. Now, that may be how it works in America. It doesn't work like that here. And that's why the Prime Minister uh, switched today to quoting long-standing international conventions prohibiting the use of chemical weapons. However, there is nothing in these uh, conventions that inherently allows other nations to take military action against such a state just because it has used chemical weapons. Certainly not without uh, wider international sanction. You are not going to actually go anywhere in terms of resolving the problem for the Syrian people unless and until you do grapple differently with this question of those terribly difficult Chinese people and them nasty Ruskies. Well, you have to incentivize the Russians to be involved in a process that actually caters for some of their needs. We know, the polls tell us, that the public is overwhelmingly against such a military strike. The British public does not want to be drawn into yet another war in the Middle East. The British public have seen that movie and they know how it ends. There's only one thing which is absolutely guaranteed. Nobody knows what's going to happen if we go down the road of military action. We've seen it too often in recent decades. And in that instance, the fact that we do not have an exit strategy um, uh, creates the difficulty I have. In conclusion, Madam Deputy Speaker, I have problems for the Honourable Gentleman's information, both with the Government motion and the Opposition Amendment. I do not believe either is ultimately achievable, uh, able to achieve the honourable ends that both sides of this House are trying to achieve. 
I'm opposed to military intervention in Syria, full stop. And to be honest with myself, and to be consistent on both questions, I will be voting in the no lobby against the government motion and against the opposition amendment. But I have to say to the House, Madam Deputy Speaker, that I have not yet heard uh, today a compelling argument to convince me that military intervention in this case is necessary or in our national interest. Yeah, yeah. But I believe that we have to always reflect on what is our national interest when, when it is a difficult uh, decision. And I do not believe that our national interest will be served by military intervention in Syria. And I do not believe that this is the way forward for this Parliament. And the idea that we're going to rush in and come back again, perhaps in a few days, just because America is pulling the shots. And I wonder what will happen. What will the Prime Minister say if over the weekend America decides to go it alone? But his comments reminded me very much indeed of what was said in the run-up to the invasion of Iraq by the USA and Britain. We were told at the time there were the Saddam Hussein regime had weapons of mass destruction. We were told that the weapons inspectors would not find any because they have been very well hidden. We were told that there was incontrovertible evidence from the intelligence services that weapons of mass destruction existed. And finally, in the last debate in this chamber, we were told that the WNDs could hit this country within 45 minutes. And what happened subsequently? We found out that what was said was not true. The intelligence had been sexed up. The uh, weapons of mass destruction did not exist. And political decisions have been taken at President Bush's ranch in America way before the conflict began.